This is Duke University. So I guess I'll, oh, I'll start. I think we just said, is that all right? <laughs> we, um, that uh, first, thank you. I mean, I'm, it was really delightful, first of all, to meet uh, Lola and to get this connection. And so we, we met and started talking about a number of things, realized there's a lots of common interests. Um, so, but partly I was just so fascinated by your career and kind of your background and sort of your trajectory. Um, and I just thought it might be interesting if we, if we to, as a way into the question of kind of race and medicine and postcoloniality, to think if you could tell us a little bit about like your route into becoming the surgeon that you are today and you know, that, that, that kind of the, the personal story behind that, if that's. Sure. Um, so uh, I was born in Nigeria and I came to the United States when I was a child, uh, about two years old. And my parents' story was the kind of proverbial immigrant story, you know, two kids, two suitcases and $200. Um, and we first landed in, in Ohio because that is where my dad had a cousin who was living who had married an American woman. And uh, Dayton, Ohio is a fairly improbable place to find uh, Nigerians, um, but there we were. and. It was a very lonely existence um, for several years. My, one of my brothers was born there, and the day he was born, it was a couple days out of, after Christmas, the snow was taller than I was at the time. So it was uh, a really remarkable time. We were so close, and we are so close as a family, because I think a lot of times when you're an immigrant, especially if you aren't part of a larger community where you're living, um, it does have a bit of a us-against-the-world feeling. Um, and so uh, and my parents also set very tall ambitions for themselves. My mother completed her MBA while, you know, raising two small kids and having a third. And my dad was driving 50 miles each way to do his job as a computer programmer. He's a computer scientist. So I guess watching them um, basically uprooting themselves to come to the United States and give us um, a remarkable set of opportunities just made us feel like we owed them. Um, at the very least, all the hard work we can put into anything we did, but also to strive for um, a modicum of the success that they obviously expected of us and hoped for us. Um, so we then moved to New Jersey, and that's where I grew up. Uh, I started off in the Newark Public Schools, which was quite a formative experience. Um, I think what people don't realize is that there's a lot of historically misunderstanding between um, African immigrants, Caribbean immigrants, and African Americans, and that was something that came to the forefront for me when I was five years old and starting in Newark um, public schools. Um, and the misunderstanding is both ways. I will say there's a lot of prejudice on the part of many African immigrants about African Americans. This idea that how can you live in America where there's so much and not do better, so to speak. Um, not taking into account you know, the historic and the systematic subjugation that's placed people in positions where what appears to be accessible is in fact not accessible. Um, and that there is something really powerful about leaving the space in which you were oppressed. And that is underappreciated, I think, with regards to um, black immigrants, that there's something very, very powerful about leaving the streets that were renamed, leaving the country that was redrawn, um, leaving the rules that were imposed upon your people, even the language, and taking that somewhere else. Um, and that I think a lot of that explains the success that you see amongst African and Caribbean immigrants in the United States. It's not being better, it's being free. Um, and so I, um, I think that was something that was very interesting for me to observe um, growing up first in newer public schools where I was one of many black children but um, one of few African children and then moving to Verona, New Jersey which is a very, um, very homogeneous town in the other dimension in that um, most of my classmates were Italian, Irish, American and Jewish um, extraction. And uh, I learned about Hanukkah for the first time and thought, this seems great. Why don't everyone celebrate Hanukkah plus Christmas? This seems great. Um, but also, uh, that was really where I, I grew up and, um, and from where I graduated from high school. And I was one of two black people in my graduating class. And I was also the valedictorian. So it was kind of an, uh, I was this kind of ex exceptionalized person in that um, I, I didn't fit a lot of the stereotypes that some of my classmates and maybe even some of my teachers had. I was just Lola. Um, and, uh, and it was a, a weird place to be. I didn't feel like I had um, a home with any particular group. I just had to be who I was. And I would say it wasn't really until I went to programs in the summer for kind of gifted and talented youth, CTY, or Center for Talented Youth through Johns Hopkins, as well as um, this governor's school where I met not only other um, you know, black women like me, but also many other immigrants and other people who thought it was fun to be smart and that it was a, a really kind of um, 
a great way to find the community. Um, anyway, so leaving Verona, I went to Harvard and I majored in history of science and I majored and, uh, and got a master's in comparative literature during my fourth year of college because I had enough AP credits to do so. Um, and I always knew I was going to go to medical school, so I figured I'm going to spend four years reading great books and expanding my mind and just taking the M MCAT and the pre-med requirements. But I will say at the end of four years, I was so tired that I decided I would take a break from med school and I worked for a couple of years as a healthcare consultant. Um, realizing ultimately that I didn't want to be on the business side of medicine, I really wanted to go to medical school. So when I went to medical school, um, had gone in thinking I was going to do OB-GYN because um, I was always interested in women's health, in women's reproductive choice, and I was involved with a lot of those organizations in medical school. But then I realized during my third year of medical school, our clinical year, that I loved the belly more than I loved the pelvis. Um, which is, it sounds like a, not an important distinction, unless you have been there. Um, and so I, uh, I, felt, I fell in double general surgery and ultimately decided I wanted to be a, um, a surgical oncologist focusing on breast and focused my research on that throughout, um, all the while trying to keep my hand in with reading good books and watching good movies and writing when I could, but it's, um, it's always challenging. So now um, my health research is in um, health disparities as well as in value-based healthcare, how to um, achieve outcomes that matter to patients for um, a reasonable amount of cost. Um, and in particular, trying to translate this value-based um, approach, which was espoused by, or actually developed by Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, hoping, hoping to translate that into resource-poor situations. Um, the case studies generally used for value-based healthcare are you know, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, certain types of specialty clinics in Europe. But the question is, can we achieve these things um, in, um, in clinics in the inner city? Can we achieve these things in low and middle income countries? Um, and I think that would be a great challenge for all of us to embrace. So here I am at Duke. Um, I feel like I'm very, 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 very blessed uh, to have the family I have, to have the husband I have who is amazing and um, my biggest cheerleader. And also just to be lucky to meet people who liked me and believed in me and, um, and uh, assumed that I belonged in places where I would not have thought I belonged. So. Thanks for that. Um, when we met, we started talking about Adichie's book, Americana, which I had not read, and I read after our conversation. Maybe some of you have read. Um, and it's true, and you had sort of said that when you were reading it, you were kind of were like, yep. You know, like there's this kind of, oh, yes, been there. And, and it, it's, it's notably around this question of kind of Africans and African Americans. But also, I guess, as I was reading, I was thinking about, maybe we can talk about this, the way in which um, you know, in that book, it becomes clear that the kind of route to the United States is often through the lens of the idea of like healthcare professions, right? Sort of this idea that that uh, the achievement of sending someone to the United States who may then enter these and that kind of, you know, the particular focus on that as a way in both the United States but also to social mobility. Um, and then this kind of countervailing thing, which is not so much in the book, but the way in which sort of from the U.S., Africa is seen as a place sort of in need of we have expertise, right? You want to go back. Exactly. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I just, I don't know, you know, just thinking about that, that kind of contradiction and which you must think about a lot, but the, how do we, you know, the kind of the way in which sort of for Afri Africans relationship to the U.S. and vice versa and how different those can be. No, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so I did my residency in Missouri and now I'm obviously here in North Carolina. And it's uh, not uncommon that a patient will say to me something like, you know, often a patient from a rural area, like, oh, our town doctor is Nigerian, or our town doctor is Ghanaian. Um, and I always think, oh, that poor soul is probably, you know, the one African person in a very large area providing health care. Mm -hmm. And that um, they're probably in many ways grateful to be there, but I always think about their kids. Mm -hmm. I always think to myself, okay, mom and dad thought this is a great opportunity. We get to be the town doctor in rural Montana, but I always think, how are their kids doing? Um, you know, two of my three brothers are also physicians, and people always ask, oh, are your parents physicians? I said, no, we're just immigrants. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think it's partly because, um, you know, my parents are brilliant people who nonetheless experienced a lot of discrimination for both being black and for being immigrants and for speaking English completely correctly with better grammar than most Americans, but with an accent. And, um, and so I think many immigrants of all backgrounds think of medicine as this kind of prejudice-free route to prosperity and to respect. I think the respect thing is even more profound than the prosperity. It's the idea that 
you know, people will not judge you, that they have to take seriously what you bring to the table because you have a skill set they don't have. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not always the case. You know, we all know that medicine is not prejudice free. I'm frankly waiting for the Me Too movement to happen in medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I, I think that that nonetheless is an, an interesting perception that persists. Um, it really persists, and I think many, many immigrant groups, mm -hmm. for better or for worse, because medicine isn't always the way to flex your intellectual um, muscles. It's not the way necessarily to achieve change that you can take back to where you came from. Um, and so I actually wonder if we're just going through as a community, a Nigerian community or West African or African community of Africans living in America, the familiar pattern seen by many immigrant groups where first of all, the first generation comes and they just sweat and they just do whatever they can. And then their kids are doctors and dentists and lawyers. And then their kids are hopefully getting into the arts and starting to change. And I think we're starting to see that. I'm seeing you know, articles about Nigerian playwrights and Senegalese musicians and restaurateurs. And I'm really excited about um, our generation collectively overcoming just the um, focus on mobility and aspiration, hopefully bringing some of our cultural arts mm -hmm. to not only the fields that are considered, quote, um, you know, prosperous, respective, but also to the American tableau, you know, making us part of the American fabric versus just kind of sleeping under it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think that is happening, like notably in the Haitian community, which I know a little bit better, but I think there is that sense that, right, the next, this generation is thinking about, right, how do we transform? I mean, partly returning to thinking about Haiti in ways, and the lang I mean, in ways that in some ways for prior generations was less of a priority, again, because the, the force of trying to make it was, was the kind of key. It was interesting because I'm thinking about, so for my parents, um, kind of medicine was a route to the United States. They were, so they were trained as med doctors in Belgium, moved here to kind of, as my mom was, I got a postdoc at NIH. And, um, but in the prior generation, there had, like my, gran my grandfather was like from a really small rural village and like the, the kind of route in mm -hmm. to respectability and a certain, uh, you know, a cer certain set of social mobility for him was medicine. And that was sort of transmit, you know, that, that was also transmitted on both sides, right? The kind of, the sense of the dignity of the doctor, right? Um, at the same time, I know my father lived through like all these transformations and how medicine works, right? And I remember his conversation. He once told me, he said, yeah, my, my, I, one of my colleagues said, uh, said like, oh, is your son a doctor? You know, kind of like assuming he would. And he, and he said proudly, he was like, no, he's become a Caribbeanist. You know? <laughs> and he's like, and you should have seen the confused look on the guy. He's like, is that a job? You know? He's like, <laughs> he's like, and he's like, no, I was like, he did become a doctor, but not that good. Yeah. But, it, but it sort of, but there was this kind of sense of his, um, I just remember it, it was interesting seeing his doubts as he was, because he was, he was a, a professor in the Navy Medical School, so he had students. Um, this is in Walter, you know, Walter Reed, and, um, but his sort of doubts about what medicine was becoming for those who went into it, right? And the kind of questions, just partly about the marketing, the markets forces, and the specialization, and this sort of sense, um, the disappearance of certain kinds of sense of care, and you know, and kind of following through. And I know, obviously, it seems like between your work as a surgeon and your research, you're really interested in finding you know, a better way for, at least for, you know, for, for women to get access to care across the board and those sorts of things. But I just don't know if that's, you know, the disjunctures between maybe what we want medicine to be and what sometimes it is. Um, you know, I don't know if that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's tough. I mean, I think over the past 10, 15 years, medical schools have increasingly focused on um, courses that I call how to be a good doctor courses. Um, they have different names everywhere. Sometimes it's practice of medicine. Sometimes it's the art of medicine, you know. Um, and they all come back to, you know, be ethical, be nice, be kind, be personable, uh, which doesn't come naturally to everyone um, and may not actually be required in certain aspects of medicine, right? I mean, that's just the reality. Um, there are going to be many people doing amazing research and providing amazing care who are not people you want to go out to dinner with. Um, and should they also go to medical school is the question. Um, I, uh, in terms of how medicine is changing, um, we're definitely becoming more specialized in that, you know, especially if you're staying in academia, many people go on to do a fellowship. I did a fellowship at MD Anderson um, Cancer Center before coming to Duke. Um, and I was just talking to actually my scrub tech today in the operating room and she was saying, gosh, whatever happened, people just did everything. And I said, well, you know, they still exist, um, and they are heroes, because that's a very hard thing to do in areas with minimal access. 
but it's just not possible to know everything. And more importantly, while most surgeons can do a lot, do you know when to do it? That's the question is, are you up enough on the research to know when you should do one procedure versus another and when you should give a medication instead of a tr surgery? Um, and that's where the, the um, specialization really is important. Um, so it's interesting that you too are an immigrant of sorts, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I actually was born in Belgium, but we yeah. moved we moved here when I was three weeks old, so it's kind <laughs> of tenuous. <laughs> I would say my Belgianness is like a little tenuous. It's yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I can claim it occasionally. Yeah. So, um. how do you feel like you're viewed when you go to Haiti? You know, do they see you as American? Do they see you as a Belgian? Do they see you as a Caribbeanist? So. It is interesting because I, I mean, I've thought about this sometimes with my accent. My accents in English or in French, right, are kind of, I mean, I don't know if I exactly have an accent in English, but I realize at certain points that my language is a little bit inflected by, particularly by having grown up in a totally bilingual space, you know. So it was in college, my second year, when the TA who was from Mexico said, like, your sentences are beautiful French sentences with English words, <laughs> but they're not actually grammatically English sentences. You know, like there are too many, there are too many phrases in this thing, you know? And I was like, that's really interesting, you know? That, um, but so, and then in French, I have kind of a Belgian accent, but then I've lived in various places. I mean, in some ways you absorb accents, I think, when you have that kind of, um, but so I, yeah, it does, I think it, it does, I mean, in some ways, maybe it's just that experience, and it was obviously very, ra very different than the kind of experience you had. We had, you know, the, obviously not the racialized forms of, but the sort of, but there was this kind of way in which of, the, especially watching parents um, who weren't really of this place, and um, it's interesting, both a parent, one parent who like really loved the unit. I mean, my dad was also six, like they, they were both actually like five or six when the Americans liberated Belgium after the occupation, and my my grandfather had been involved in the resistance and stuff. So there was partly like my dad always sort of said like you know basically when they rolled into Liège, you know, in '45, I was like I don't know who these people are, but wherever <laughs> they came from, I'm moving there when I grow up. You know, like and you have to actually, you know, Americans were larger than Belgium. Like there's this kind, they really were. Like they were just taller, you know. So there was this, there was a, he has this kind of like superhero. And so, so for him, America was, was linked to that, you know, childhood experience. Um, so he had this, he was very devoted to the United States as an idea in a certain way. But still, these kind of disjunctures about what the, um, it's also, it sounds very different because they, we, I grew up, they were at NIH and NIH was full of, um, is, you know, a very foreign space. I mean, most of the people that we knew were in that. Um, I do feel like though, um, it does shape kind of how you see other places too, and it does come out that you know if you're you, if you've been in transit in that way, you you kind of link up around that experience to some extent, even if it's you know different in every case. So um, and and certainly did probably shape like why I was interested in certain kinds of questions and you know um, we we talked also about sort of just surgery like the surgical field you know like because I think you know it's a pretty intense as you, you know I, I was just kind of oh, deeply impressed you know by surgeons <laughs> and sort of <laughs> yeah, but, okay well, yeah um, but but also I mean it's in terms of like gender and race and kind of inclusivity right within medicine if I understand correctly it's like a it's a it's 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 a battle right and I, I maybe I'm wrong or I just kind of want your take on that on being a surgeon you know and what do you see? Is, the, is it changing? Is, is there more opportunities for, you know, more people to come into it or is it? Yeah, so I would say, again, as I mentioned before, I feel incredibly blessed. I feel like I was born in the right moment, so to speak, that I've had allies throughout my life mm -hmm. who believed that I could when I didn't even know there was something to can. Like, I did not know that you could do this and go here and do these kinds of things. Um, right straight from my kindergarten teacher who came to my wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and so I um, feel very just lucky in terms of the mentors I encountered at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, senior surgeons, junior surgeons coming through the ranks, men, women, um, who just took me under their wing. And um, what I will say about surgery is that it's historically been a field that is notable for being very hierarchical, um, for being pretty intense. Um, but one thing that's really great about surgeons is they're pretty straight talking folk and they'll tell you to your face what they think. There is very little whispering behind people's backs. And, and the other thing I will say is that they value very much just boots on the ground hard work. So if you just show up and you play and you work hard, people want to teach you and they'll take you under their wing. And I had people who wanted to teach me. And um, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are definitely a lot of, uh, let's say, politically incorrect things that fly around within surgery. 
But I actually think that um, in many ways, especially at certain programs, there's been a lot of support for ethnic minorities, a lot of support for women. Um, I think um, the leadership here in Duke Surgery is amazing um, in terms of their commitment to inclusivity and to promoting all of us who don't fit the mold of what a Duke surgeon looked like 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are challenges, obviously, of having been um, a black woman coming through surgery, but I actually feel um, like I just had a lot of support and a lot of help. And, um, and I just felt glad to be there and to be part of that space and hopefully um, changing people's views about what a surgeon could look like. Mm -hmm. so. It's true. It's kind of interesting to think that the kind of that tech on some level, right at the end of the day, if like you're good, <laughs> and then, yeah, then you know, there's a way in which there, the, that, that yeah, yeah. So. Um, but uh, can you? Just, what is your favorite part about doing surgery? I, that's maybe a strange question, but I mean, you must. Mm -hmm. There must be something. I mean, I can imagine it's scary and difficult, but there must be something really powerful about um, you know being able to heal in that way. Or I yeah, know. I think one of the best things about surgery is actually kind of the the routinization of surgery that, you know, it begins with showing up, you know, you have a certain kind of pattern to your day. And, um, and it's really kind of the team effort in the operating room that you're all working together. Um, there is just something really cool about the privilege of being allowed to do surgery, you know. Um, as I tell people, um, without that medical license, I would be committing assault. <laughs> Um, and so for patients to, uh, to let us do that is a pretty remarkable um, thing. Um, it, it, it does feel great to, to know that you've you know, cured cancer. I'm a breast cancer surgeon. Um, and it does feel great to be able to tell your patient you know, afterwards, it's gone, we got it all, et cetera. Um, but it's really hard to tell them when you haven't um, or to tell them that it was a lot worse than we thought. And um, so I would say my favorite part of, sur of surgery itself is just the flow of the operation, you know, um, creating, finding planes, um, kind of just fixing what's in front of you and healing someone. Mm -hmm. um, and then the greater part of being a surgeon actually is I think the intimacy of the connection that you have to someone you've left a scar on. You know, every person you've ever put a scar on, every complication you've ever had, that belongs to you and you feel it forever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a powerful connection. I would say it's almost a spiritual connection having done that. Um, and I feel really privileged to be able to have that with people. Patients tell their surgeons things they don't tell anyone, not even their spouses. Um, one of my mentors, the late, great uh, Jeff Moley, who just passed away actually end of last year, um, he's a thyroid surgeon who discovered um, a gene involved in a hereditary form of thyroid cancer. And he was a, a real character, and I, I miss him dearly. He pointed out that in the course of working with people who have a genetic mutation, people flew from all over the country and all over the world to see him, he found out that the non-paternity rate was something like 10%. As in when you start digging into people's family trees and wondering, huh, how is it that you have this gene when there is no one in your family that has this gene from this side? And then stories emerge. So just that kind of insight into the human experience that things aren't as clean as we think they are I think is something that really emerges in the course of medicine, but also often in surgery. And it's a privilege that patients tell you these things and trust that you won't share them, that you won't share them. Right, there's that kind of intimacy of the, the right. fact of, yeah, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, we, and I wanted to hear more about this when we talked a little bit about the, um, just your research, so your research around disparities and access to, to breast cancer treatment and those sorts of things. and. Um, you know, it sounds like obviously you're both in your work as a surgeon and thinking about these in a big data sense, you're trying to address this. But I mean, if you could you tell us a little bit about like what you're finding in terms of both what's been happening and then the ways in which that might change, you know, or what, what, would, what would need to, to be done to change it? Yeah, so my interest in uh, disparities in breast cancer started in medical school when I was working um, in a specialty clinic for underserved patients. And coincidentally, one of my patients was a 27-year-old Nigerian woman um, who'd been in the country very recently, had a very large palpable breast mass. And, um, and on paper, she looked a lot like me. We were the same age. Um, and, uh, and it was just really hard to look at her. She's just crying during this exam. And, um, and that prompted me to look at the population of patients served by that clinic. And we found out that 
relative to patients who presented directly to a tertiary cancer center, the rates of um, locally advanced breast cancer or a metastatic cancer, stage three and four cancer, um, was three to four times as high. So like 10 to 15 percent of patients presenting to um, the Siteman Cancer Center at Washington University had stage three or four breast cancer, while about 30 to 40 percent of those presenting through the specialty clinic had um, breast cancer at an advanced stage. And that prompted, that little retrospective review ultimately prompted um, a reshaping of um, the referral process in St. Louis, where we kind of realized that part of the problem was that women would come from, let's say, an FQHC, and then they would go to the specialty clinic, and then they'd have to go back to the FQHC to get a referral to go to the cancer center. And so in the process, and this was again before there was a lot of digitalization of mammography and of records, so in the process, inevitably, records were lost, mammograms were lost, mammograms had to be redone, and so you're losing time. And so we found out that the median time from um, first having either an abnormal image or abnormal physical exam to actually um, getting a diag to getting um, treatment was 93 days, and that would be completely unacceptable um, in most medical circumstances. And to the credit of the you know leaders in the St. Louis medical community, that led to a change where we again allowed for direct referral to cancer centers. Um, but nonetheless, I remain I was and remain horrified by the very piecemeal approach to healthcare that exists in this country for patients um, with, who are under or uninsured. And that's something that's been of interest to me um, throughout. Um, one thing is a good news is that for the most part, across racial groups, we have parity with regards to screening. Um, in women age 50 to 64, um, something like 80% of women undergo screening, mammograms. Um, the notable exception being Native Americans who are continue to um, be screened at lower rates. But the concerning thing is that what do women do after screening? So if you have an abnormal screen, um, you get a call back to have a more, um, most of them have had mammograms which say uncomfortable <laughs> um, exam to kind of confirm the findings. And I think there is some concern that people aren't necessarily coming back, or that the quality of the follow-up isn't as good, or that the quality of the initial screening isn't as good. You know, in some ways, a bad screen is worse than no screen, because you have this false reassurance that, oh, I was looked at and I'm fine. But actually, uh, here at Duke, we review all the imaging of people coming from Duke to, to Duke from other places, and about one in five patients' images, we find something that changes the clinical course of action, which tells us that in places where there isn't a high volume of um, breast cancer care provided, we're missing things. And this is happening across the country. So in terms of my research, uh, I'm interested in ways in which we can figure out more accurately who is going to do better and who is going to do worse from breast cancer. I mean, 95% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer are going to do great and are going <laughs> to survive. But there are certain groups we know that do systematically worse. And so um, I'm looking at various things, um, specifically to how do we prognosticate better um, in ways that take into account risk factors that are modifiable as well as demographic information that we know is associated with worse outcome. Um, so that's kind of where my research is going, what I'm interested in. So it's going to look at um, some patient reported outcomes as well, looking at whether there are social factors that um, span different groups that are being under-discussed and under-managed um, amongst a lot of people that we could do better and get people to care earlier and have them get through their treatment with greater completion rates. So a surgeon, and we've heard, heard a lot about your, the challenges of your training as an immigrant, uh, maybe as a black woman in the U.S., but what about your humanities training, and where does it fit into being a mm -hmm. surgeon? Have you found a way to bring that into your practice, into the diagnostic interview, even into the operating <laughs> theater? <laughs> um, I know there's, there's some, especially in the Native American community, some evidence that there is, there are different outcomes um, if you invoke certain sort of rituals before uh, performing a, a surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to see if you uh, mm. make that, if you make use of your training um, in uh, literature wow. or your <laughs> interests in reading. I can write pretty easily, which is often a stumbling block for researchers in medicine that, um, you know, once I have my data, I can kind of write a manuscript pretty quickly, um, which I'm grateful for. I know it's not something people can do easily or that they enjoy, but I actually enjoy it. So that's something that I think has been um, an asset for me. Um, I think 
being a reader just makes you have, I think, more perspectival mobility. You're better able to see where people are coming from, even if their lives are not like your lives. And I think that that has informed me. I think that's why I can connect with people who are very unlike me, um, that we can find some kind of commonality that maybe not based on my having lived it, but my having read about it. Um, some of the work I enjoyed the most when I was um, doing my master's degree was actually work from the Indian subcontinent. I just was overwhelmed by how much felt so similar to the stories my father and my mother said. And I don't know if in part it was related to British colonial rule in both places, um, but uh, you know, that was always just very kind of striking. Um, Americana, you know, I mentioned, which we were discussing before, um, made me feel like someone had a little camera looking into my life. <laughs> but there are actually other stories I've read um, that made me think I had a camera looking into what my parents' life might have been like. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't because it took place in Nigeria. It, sometimes it took place in Trinidad. Sometimes it took place in um, Hyderabad. And I thought that was kind of remarkable that there was this unifying thread, even though they seemed like such different places. So in my daily life as a surgeon, I would say that the ability to write and communicate, which both in the verbal as well as the written sense, I think has been heightened by my humanities training. And I think my patients appreciate that. I think I can explain uh, medical stuff in a way that people understand. Um, my husband, having been a guinea pig for many years, he's a brilliant Harvard and Oxford trained political scientist who has no medical background whatsoever. Um, and I always think if Ian can understand this, then they can understand this. So that's kind of my goal. The way in which you um, perform surgery or your recommendations for a patient, has anything ever changed based on your humanities training, your reading, your... One of my patients um, asked me what movies I'd recently seen. And I was kind of interested by that. And it turned out it's because they Googled me and saw that I said that if I weren't a physician, I would probably be a film critic for the New York Times. Um, and so we had a really good talk about like my favorite director, Pedro Almodovar, and how much I enjoy his work. And I just think he's amazing. And how I'm trying to figure out when my six and five year old are old enough to watch his movies. Um, and, uh, and so that was a really, and that was a really nice connection, I think. Um, and we had a long talk about just, you know, how you, how you do that. So, um, I don't know if it's changed things, but I do think it allows for kind of really fun, interesting conversations and connections that have been really, really worthwhile. Just came across a remarkable interview by one of your breast surgery colleagues from UCSF, uh, uh, Laura Esserman. Yes. <laughs> the singing surgeon. And I don't know if you read the interview, but she, for years, has been singing to her patients in, in pre-op, and, and they can request her to hmm. sing. She must have a pretty good voice because. She says, if it's an aria, you have to give me a week to rehearse it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she said, uh, and the impact on the patients, she said, what do you give them for, for, for pre-medication? Pre she says, I am the pre-medication. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, That's uh, funny. Uh, well, I mean, right. it, it, it enhances the whole experience, I'm sure. So that was a, a pretty amazing. Uh, a question for you, since you do have these dialogues with your patients, uh, uh, I have a particular interest in women who have dreams about their breast cancer. Have you ever had a woman tell you that they had a dream and that's why they wanted to get their mammogram? Not that I can remember, but I am struck by the extent to which the time course over which patients believe they first noticed they had a mass is likely not correlating with what was probably happening. I think the discordance between perception and reality in terms of how long symptoms have been there is pretty profound. Um, and it's, it's known to be a disconnect that, you know, especially actually if you present with late stage disease, you are more likely to want to believe that it just happened. Even though based on the biology of the cancer, it seems unlikely that it just happened um, because no one wants to believe that this was their fault. And I always assure them it's not your fault because no doubt your life was full of so many other things that, you know, noticing this lump that's been there is not the first thing that you wanted to deal with or could deal with. So no one is, not that I can recall anyone specifically talking about dreams, but nonetheless, the way people um, think about their experience of cancer up to the point of diagnosis is um, very interesting. Um, and that Things could are going on in their life leading up to the diagnosis. Yeah, so interestingly, one study um, that we did in St. Louis uh, that we published in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, um, looking at this population of women from the specialty clinic who were presenting with late stage cancer, 
um, we found across all groups, whether you were presenting to the private health care system or to the specialty clinic, that um, marriage and being partnered, so being married or partnered, was associated with a higher risk of late diagnosis. So most people think of marriage as like a benefit, but the benefit is mainly to straight men. <laughs> and um, the reality is that uh, women put a lot of other people's priorities ahead of their own, mm -hmm. and that leads to a lot of neglect about themselves. And even many of my patients going through treatment, I have to tell them, this is the year of you. Mm -hmm. This next year, everyone needs to be with you. You need to put your foot up at, feet up at Christmas. You do not need to be making the turkey. You're on chemo. Um, and that's hard to convince a lot of women to do because they don't feel like there's anyone else who can do those things. So that's hard. So as a historian and a literary uh, critic or a literary historian, how does health uh, come across the, the pages that you're reading? And, mm -hmm. and what have you done with it? You yeah. It? It's interesting because after the conversation, I kind of realized that So my very first move into Caribbean studies was um, basically we were discussing this that the, the 19 I was in college in the 1980s at the time when the AIDS epidemic was beginning um, and my my mother was doing some research as a neurologist but she was doing some research around it and you probably as you probably remember there was a moment when Haitians were blamed for having brought AIDS to the United States um, at a time of large-scale migration and so forth and um, so I, and I knew I knew enough. Like I asked my parents to know is this that they that they that really no one had any idea that this was sort of scientifically you know this really early on that it was a kind of fairly spurious the actually original theory was written you know in a way that wasn't convincing and yet it was taken as truth you know kind of socially and culturally right it very quickly there was discrimination against Haitians and this kind of idea so really my first I mean I had had some inklings of interest in the Caribbean but my first like research paper at Princeton was just asking this question like how can something that's palpably it's not really true in any scientific sense be taken true culturally right and what is it about the way that Haitians are viewed in this country that it became very easy for people to say you know disease has come from Haiti and um, I don't know if you're familiar with the novel Mumbo Jumbo by Ishmael Reed um, but uh, I was taking a class where Barbara Browning a mentor of mine taught that class and in it it's a kind of this 1972 really interesting novel, but in it um, there's a disease called Jess Grew, which is essentially black culture, right? It's kind of like a form of black culture. And, and there's this, it's basically a war between this kind of Western idea that's fearing black culture. And black culture is this kind of disease that spreads from Haiti into the, the Americas. So the wild thing was that there was a way in which he had basically, he had in a satirical sense identified the sort of ideological space in which the Caribbean was figured as a site of disease, right? And um, so anyway, it's a long way of sort of saying that that, that from the, was the very tr the first trigger, and it's always been something that's concerned me, the ways in which um, just these kind of ideas of health and disease, of course, really profoundly shape the way in which Haiti's viewed and how kind of the question of, of aid and humanitarianism kind of rolls out. Um, and then actually, again, in Princeton, my first um, more detailed research was actually in medical anthropology, so I went and did work in Guadeloupe on um, sort of traditional healing and the relationship between biomedicine and traditional healing in this Guadeloupe. And, and the main character of my senior thesis was a, a fellow who was um, what's known as a gadetzafe, which is like someone who sort of sees into the beyond, just kind of a spirit healer, but he was sick, like he had a thrombosis, and so he basically was in the hospital for like long-term treatment. Um, but people went to the hospital to see him as a healer even as he was including people who worked at the hospital. You know, so there was this really interesting interface between this French, very French biomedical system and then you know, these other forms of healing. You know. I remember a great conversation with him because he, he read a lot of sort of stuff from the United States about like, occult things that he read in the United States. And he was like, there are a lot of really powerful healers in the United States. And he didn't mean the doctors. You know? <laughs> he meant this other space. So it was like this, you know, this vision of this whole, this kind of particular vision of um, but so that's, it's true that a lot of my work later has, has gone in other directions, but I always think about the fact that those original questions, you know, on that interface uh, kind of made it, like raise, raise the question. I think it is partly because of, I had grown up in this, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about language that I remember my mom saying like, you, you, when you were six, you started saying the word oligodendrocyte, you know, <laughs> which was like one of her major things that she studied, you know, and I'd be like, oligodendrocytes, you know. <laughs> it was like one of my favorite. And my son, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's a neuroscientist. And, um, um, you know, in contrast, my son very early on began, once he marched into my room and said, Haitian Revolution, you know. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is. Um, but, but, yeah, so I do, I think that there's a kind of, um, and so these kinds of conversations are, are fascinating because I do think 
of course, the kind of whole question of global health and, and how health is thought about, I think, still really inflects the place of Haiti and the imagination and, um, you know, so. Uh, Paul Farmer trained at Duke. He did, yep. Went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And then he started a, like a huge uh, yeah. program in Haiti. It's still going on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we have a student that Deborah and I studied with us who went and worked there, a great student. Uh, um, yeah, no, an extraordinary. I mean, in fact, his um, work on the AIDS and his first book is called AIDS and Accusation, and it's really an ethnographic study of the kind of beginnings of the AIDS epidemic in Haiti and also the this kind of international blame and how that played out. Um, and uh, has written really powerfully about Haiti as well, Uses of Haiti, which is a very kind of critical look at U.S. Um, kind of pol policy towards Haiti. Um, and yeah, and the partners in health. But yeah, he was a he was a BA uh, did a, an anthropology degree at Duke actually. Um, interestingly, so that's a really yeah interesting trajectory. And partners in health, I think, is you know an extraordinary organization in terms of its grounding and um, and care with which they kind of deal with the healthcare, which is different. I mean, it's particularly successful and um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm one of the general surgery residents here at Duke. I work closely with Dr. Fayanju. Um, and actually had the chance to work with partners involved in the college uh, back when I was a medical student here. Oh, wow. So one of the you know most telling experiences that I had while working in college in Nouvelle was seeing patients who uh, were presenting very late with their breast cancer, uh, very advanced stages. And one of the most striking reasons was because they were often seeking care with local healers before they chose to seek care at what we would consider sort of, you know, westernized or more um, mm -hmm. mainstream healthcare metrics. And one of the challenges that I faced, again, as an immigrant, uh, I've spoken to Dr. a bit about this, again, as an immigrant and someone very rooted in their own cultural heritage and upbringing, was feeling like the medical care that I was providing was at odds with mm -hmm. the patient, or, you know, with these patients and their cultural upbringing. So I was wondering if, you know, potentially both of you could speak to that intersection or interface of, uh, you know, traditional medicine, you know, uh, rooted in culture versus what we would consider sort of the standard of care. And this was something that came up a lot around the AIDS epidemic in particular um, in Brazil and elsewhere in part because, um, you know, and there's a lot of different ways to think about it. So part of it was, I think, a, f a first level was often, could we get the traditional healers, could we educate people so that they can tell the people they're talking to, you know, to, to go to the biomedical, essentially, to go to the, um, and again, it's interesting, this was the, the question in that original thesis that I'd written, which is like, are these things, you know, do they coexist? Can they inform each other? Um, there's usually some sort of sense, like what you're talking about, which can be the case of an antithetical, right, that one, in effect, that one is sort of a, a problem, in a sense, because it's, you know, it's, they can't cure something that the, um, obviously, in so many cases, that just the question of access is, is is key, right? To some extent, I think most, certainly most Haitians would take advantage of any number of healthcare options if they were accessible, if they're, right? And so um, it's less the question of the, of the conflict between them as the fact that sometimes only one is really available. But it is also interesting how much, um, on the other hand, these kinds of things around, like a voodoo healing, for instance, does have a very holistic, you know, relationship to the healing process, right? So that, um, you know, there's a kind of whole, a, whole, a, a sense that I think increasingly there's a, a, a worry that is lacking in certain kinds of care in the United States, right? That the, that a disease, like what even what you're describing, like a disease process is, you know, very concrete things, but it's also a whole question of like, how does your community come around you to help you heal? You know, what are the conditions under which you're going to heal? And those are things that are more strong, I mean, very kind of central to at least the traditions that I'm familiar with in the Caribbean, right? Where the kind of social and communal dimensions of, of health and the process come in. So. I mean, in a utopian sense, one can imagine that both, I certainly know a lot of like, like Ungal in, in Haiti who will, will say like, you're, will basically say like, you need to go to a doctor, you know, <laughs> like, and you also need to come back and we're gonna work on making sure that you heal, you know, on all the other levels, right? In other words, that, right, that the healing process is going to require a number of things, some of which they can provide and some of which we can provide. And I think maybe that's the sort of the ideal setting, but yeah. I think there is a, you know, a, as you said, a tension between what people can access and what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and all sometimes, you know, what you can access becomes what you want because you don't want to believe that what you want you can't have, right? So mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, the truth of the matter is many of my patients who are American and have lived in America their whole lives, 
bring their own cultural context to how they think their cancer should be treated. You know, let's say they grew up um, in a family where they, you know, believed heavily in kind of vitamin use or believed heavily that, you know, diet. Many, many, many people think that their diet can determine the trajectory of their lives. And that is shaped in some level by, you know, your local culture of food, your local culture of body image, how that influences, you know, what you think cancer does. And so I would, I actually think it's striking how often I field questions that are not rooted in what we would strictly call science, that are rooted very much in people's health belief system, whether that's culturally prescribed by a particular, you know, country of origin or how they grew up in their own family. And, um, and so trying to be sensitive to those questions it, I think comes out of a greater sense of cultural competence that whether your belief system that's at slightly at odds with what I want to do is rooted in being Haitian or rooted in being from um, you know, rural North Carolina or rooted in being from California, all those things need to be approached in a sensitive way and still while offering this is what we know based on the evidence we have. That's not to discount what you do, but um, I don't have evidence for that. And that's what I usually say is I don't have evidence for that. I'm not saying it won't work, um, but um, I'm saying we do know this does work and that's why I'd recommend it. Um, in general, I was just thinking about the fact that, so I'm personally often mistaken for being Haitian, um, like all the time, or being Dominican. Those are the two. Um, people just start speaking Creole to me or um, Spanish. And, um, and, I, and it always kind of, Whenever I reflect on um, Haitian culture, but also culture from um, Dominican Republic and Cuba, I always feel both this kind of um, awe at the preservation of appearance, right? The fact that people look like me there because they basically became probably the same area, um, but also just such profound remorse, thinking about what their ancestors had to do to maintain these cultural um, narratives and ties through hundreds of years of subjugation. And so it always kind of breaks my heart to both see that kinship and to know what it costs them to keep that connection um, to West Africa. Um, and so again, I think about the stress of, um, you know, being Haitian and navigating this burden of having been the first black republic, you know, and, um, and yet being seen by the world as a source of all these ills when what they were doing from the get-go was so remarkable. Um, I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what struck me, right, that in studying Haiti early on was the extent of the burden placed on, right? And this, and it's in my first research, it was like that, yeah. Descriptive resources. Yeah, right? yeah. So. And what, what my first research taking me to the U.S. occupation of Haiti, which involved a lot of medical like sort of medical work, right? And kind of um, a lot of doctors sort of sent from the United States, but in the context of a really brutal, you know, clearly colonial occupation, right? And the ways in which that, ge that and that occupation then generated a series of ideas about health and hate. So there's kind of these trajectories and, or, um, and um, Haiti in particular is a country that has like a, I think has been burdened with so much, you know, in it. So, um, anyway. I have a question mm. regarding heartbreak, um, mm. but a different concept. How do you, how do doctors handle heartbreak of patients who die? I mean, how do you, how do you handle that in your, your whole being, your spirit, seeing that mm. so often? What do you have to do to sort of like prepare yourself not to I guess maybe succumb to so much heartbreak grief when you have patients who die? I think um, there's no way you can really prepare yourself. I think all of us have um, varying levels of comfort with the extent to which they let their professional life seep into their personal life and vice versa. Um, all of my patients have my pager number and I let's say they can call me 24 hours, seven days a week. Many people would find that very invasive. But I actually find that patients are wonderfully respectful of your time, and they really only call if there's a problem. And particularly for my patients who um, are in challenging circumstances, including many of my patients at the Veterans Hospital where I run the breast program there, um, they are women who I want them to be able to reach me, especially if they can't reach anybody. So we become very close. In terms of preparing for death, I embrace whatever view of spirituality or afterlife my patients might have. 
I do not think it is my place to impose on them a worldview. I very much just speak the language that they want to speak, and I reflect it. I don't say things I don't believe in, but I also very much um, strengthen whatever gives them strength. I don't feel like that is my place to try and make them believe something in particular. I think it's perfectly human to cry with patients and to cry with their spouses when they're struggling. Um, I have not yet been to the funeral of a patient, but I imagine there are some patients for whose funerals I will attend. And um, my six and five-year-old boys are very comfortable talking about death. I don't think they really understand it, but they love watching videos of like melanoma surgery and <laughs> brain surgery and talking about conjunctivitis. And um, it's pretty funny. But, uh, but I think what's being really matter of fact with them at the fact that death is just another part of life. Um, I try to emphasize, you know, to my patients how much we care about the quality of their lives and the run up to whatever end we all are going to meet um, and that we're very much part of their team in the process. And so I think actually the people who really deal with death on a regular basis are our medical oncologists, those who deal with um, metastatic disease. You know, being a breast surgeon is kind of a privilege. Our patients do great after surgery. Um, and when they have metastatic disease, they don't come back to us. So um, it's a rare patient who I'm taking care, care of who presents with a terminal illness at presentation. So I'm lucky in that way. I'm interested in, this is uh, Arlene Rodimus and her concept of weathering, and this is the stress of minorities. Her first work found that uh, uh, mothers, uh, Puerto Rican mothers and African American mothers make lower birth weight babies. She attributes it a lot to stress. Uh, and uh, early aging, I do work with aging. And so I'm interested, first of all, the studies appear to suggest that uh, your outcome is worse if, you, if you're African American and under the age of 40 with breast cancers and other cancers. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you see that, that the rate of progression yeah. might be more rapid. Um, I have a number of very young women in my practice um, of all races. Um, particularly at the Veterans Hospital, the VA. Um, weathering, for me, is a very difficult topic because, of course, I think about myself. And I think about the ways in which I, I suspect I am carrying weight that I probably shouldn't be carrying while also trying to be part of the rat race that comes with being an academic surgeon. Um, I know my husband worries about me. Uh, in terms of my patients, um, I do see the extent to which many of my women of color patients that they are bearing a lot of burdens. Um, and that's true even for the ones who on paper are very successful because um, it takes a lot of work to look happy. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of work to not look tired and to not look annoyed which you actually have to do a lot if you're a black woman because people think you're angry. Um, and that we, at some level, that just becomes part of your, your kind of baseline level. And you, and, but at the same time, it's working on you. And the difficulty is that, you know, um, you know, people often think melanin makes you look young. People always say to me, are you old enough to be doing my surgery? Are you old enough to be prescribing my um, medication? But um, I think for a lot of people, appearance belies their lived experience and belies um, what's happening in their bodies. So um, the weathering concept uh, is very interesting to me, and I think there is a lot of truth to it. And um, I think it will take such a radical change in society, not just in healthcare, to improve weathering. Um, I'd love to be part of that process, but I think it really needs to be collective effort. I heard the same NPR study um, story about that, and uh, it was one of those driveway moments. I sat there and listened to the whole thing. So. First, your story of coming to the U.S. very young. Um, my husband and I recently befriended a Cameroonian family. It sounds very similar because we saw them in the airport looking so lost. <laughs> How can we help you? Yeah. But then they were moving to Texas, so we're here in Durham. Um, what could you have? What would you have needed as this lonely child growing up from a you know, far away American? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then actually kind of leading off from that, how do you, if you're telling your patients don't cook a Christmas turkey and put your feet up and make it the year of you, how do you as a surgeon 
super busy care for yourself? That's a good question. And then the other one is, I'm really interested in this issue of intimacy. And I guess the best way to ask it is, what do you think, why do your patients tell you things that they've not even told their spouse? What, what creates that sense of intimacy between you and them? I'll start with the beginning. So what could have been helpful? Um, I don't know if there's anything that could have made it easier other than seeing other people who reminded me of where we came from. I think um, I was so young that I think it would have been hard for me to express longing in words. My parents said I would just sometimes point at the door and say, go back, mm -hmm. roughly, somewhere, <laughs> not here. Um, and uh, it's not clear that, but at the same time, you know, I was talking with a, a friend of mine who's um, also Nigerian-American, also a physician at Duke, and we kind of worry about our kids, that they're going to lack the resilience that we have from what it means to be alone and figuring things out. That we worry that, you know, it's wonderful seeing them and knowing that they feel like they belong, but at some level there's a strength that comes from not belonging and figuring it out anyway. Um, and so that's what I would say. I don't know if there's anything you can do to change it. I think it made me who I am in so many ways, it made me so close to my family. Um, but uh, I think the best thing is sometimes, I think, you know, that was also an era before Skype. You know, now that there's Skype and there's, you know, Facebook, you see your family in a way that we just didn't see them for years and years and years. So um, I'm glad the kids now at least have some of that opportunity. Um, the second question was about um, taking care of myself. So I do go to yoga weekly, um, and uh, I try and make that every Sunday morning. Um, it is hard. Uh, my yoga teacher always says, she's also a mom and a programmer, she says, sometimes the yoga is just making it to your mat. And I think that is very true, because there have definitely been days where it's like, okay, I could stay and do more charts, I could stay and finish that paper, I could stay and make breakfast, or I could take an hour and a half for myself and go do yoga. And so. I try to do that. Um, I actually walk a lot. Um, I did drive today because I didn't know quite how the bus system was going to work, but I actually take the bus most days to work. It starts um, pretty early, even early enough for surgeons to get here on time most days, and just having those 10 minutes during on my way to the bus stop in the morning helps me have some time to kind of process things and think. So, um, and I take family walks with my family a lot, which we really enjoy too. Um, and that's one of the great things about living in this area, just how great the natural beauty is that, you know, you can get escape into the forest and, um, and enjoy that. Uh, interestingly, my parents, I think having grown up in a, you know, my dad in a more rural area, my mom grew up in Lagos, which is a very busy city, but they are, like many immigrants I know, very loath to interact with nature out here. Mm -hmm. And they would admit that. They would not deny that in any way. You know, they're always fussing about mosquito bites. I'm like, there's no malaria here. Don't worry about it. They're always fussing about dirt and things that, you know, I know that they often didn't wear shoes growing up. So it's interesting that they've reacted against um, their probably more natural intimacy with nature when they moved here in some ways. Um, and then in terms of the intimacy with my patients, um, I don't know. I think a lot of times it's just that people feel like they're kind of laying it all on the line at some level, that you need to know them in order to know how to take care of them. Um, you need to know if they're still smoking crack. You need to know if they think they might be carrying someone else's baby. Um, all those things have happened. Um, and I'm glad they tell us because we do need to know those things. It's very important. Um, but I personally also, um, I don't share about my life very much because I'm just a private person and I think was raised to be so. But I exhibit an openness. I sit there and I let there be silence. Um, I let them fill it. I try not to just um, keep saying, what questions do you have, what questions do you have? I let them sit, I let them grieve. Because um, often they're not just grieving their cancer, they're grieving the loss of what they thought the next few years would look like. Um, even if that's just going to be a year of treatment and cure for the rest of their lives, that's still a year they're never going to have back from being with cancer. So I think letting them have the silence and fill the silence helps. Well, I was just wanted, I was curious to see, you know, your own uh, interest in uh, Caribbean areas. How did that evolve uh, in terms of, I know you talked about HIV and AIDS, mm -hmm. but was that, was that the segue? Or that was really the beginning, and I mean, I, I guess I developed an interest in um, from there, in all the ways in which kind of history and culture sort of shapes the 
contemporary world and politics, and in particular around Haiti. So that um, you know, because that first that first work was about going and sort of understanding the historical roots of a particular, in a relatively specific crisis, which was how this had happened. You know, what I described earlier. Um, but then that kind of giving me a sense of a, of a kind of method and of the importance of history. Um, and that's kind of stayed with me throughout, that the, you know, just a kind of belief that, um, you know, that the, the being able to tell stories about the history that's shaped our present moment has a kind of social import and a kind of, uh, yeah, so I, I suppose that's, but it really was, it's interesting because that was really the kind of trigger. I mean, then the, it just also became an intellectual interest, but um, I just, just keep, I keep in my work too, discovering all the layers of this that kind of unfold, but um, uh, yeah. So. Um, was there any connection with Belgium? I, I'm not sure I know enough about the history of Belgium and the Caribbean. Uh, not really. I mean, I once had a very funny conversation with Danny Laferriere, who is a Haitian writer, about we were like, I was like, the Belgians are the Haitians of Europe. And he was like, yes. Because I was like, I was like, you know, we can't really form government. Like, there's a lot of common, you know, peop there's jokes about us both. You know, we have this kind of, I mean, I often say about Belgium, you know, Belgium is sort of extraordinary. It's had like a 40 year long civil war without a single casualty. <laughs> And so sometimes I'm like, we should export our model of civil war. Like it's like very, it's like super tedious. You know, it's the Walloon Flemish. It's a linguistic conflict, and it's intense. Like it's not, it's not a minor issue. And it's one of the things that actually my parents are glad that they left. Right? They felt like it's a small country already, and then there's these two linguistic groups, and a professional life is kind of um, so. But it's when I joked about it being a tenuous. Um, I mean, I think there is, there are ways in which. I mean, I haven't and. People have always said, like, you should work on the Congo. I mean, there are ways in which I could go back into that. Um, but um, it's shaped some things. Like, my work on soccer, I look at a lot at the kind of Belgian and French soccer and immigration and race. So there, there are connections. And I wrote a piece, actually, after the Brussels terrorist attacks. Like, someone asked me to write a piece. And it was interesting realizing that I, I had a thing to say about Belgium and Brussels that, you know, was here. And I, it wasn't like my, but that, so at certain moments, I feel like there is that kind of connection. Um, but it's it's tension. I mean, I like Belgian nationalism because it's sort of so funny, you know. So it kind of gives you like a, a kind of you know, it's different. You know, it's a way of looking at the world from this kind of uh, angle of, you know, of of uh, like a humorous approach to some things that are less humorously taken in this country, for instance. So, yeah. So, yeah. But thank you. For, so, yeah.